the talk is related to the uh, I mean the offer about the transitional access uh, within the remade Harry project but uh, uh, it's also an occasion for me to describe the facilities and opportunities of uh, radiation and diagnostics that we have here in our uh, in our group in our laboratory I here mentioned just in alphabetical order the people which are involved in uh, ABC laser and FEL terrors uh, um, uh, group. And uh, well, as mentioned, this talk is part of a serious webinar where Laser Lab Europe members introduce their techniques available to academic and industry users in the field of recyclable materials. Transnational access is provided by to international scientists to more than 50 uh, research infrastructure being part of the Remade Hari project, within which is a project funded by Horizon Europe Infrastructure. The talk will be about uh, the offer present within the project at NEA Centro Ricerca Frascati. Just a few words about the NEA for those of you that uh, are not familiar with uh, our institution. NEA is one of the main Italian research institutions with centers spread all over Italy, and you can see here. Uh, within Eurofusion, NEA is the reference Italian institution. You see, uh, I mean, Eurofusion uh, beneficiaries and countries, and uh, here there is Italy. But NEA is not only related to nuclear activities. In fact, there's a very broad, widespread, uh, differentiated, differentiated uh, set of activities like, like for energy efficiency, renewable energy sources, nuclear energy, as mentioned, climate and environment, safety and health, new technologies, and electric system research. These are, I mean, you can see it's quite, it's quite a broad uh, range of, uh, of activities. Okay, now we go to our research center in Frascati, uh, which is one of the main centers for fusion, which is uh, not only for inertial confined fusion, but also speci especially for magnetic confined fusion. There was a Frascati tokamak upgrade, which is now dismissed, and a new tokamak, the diverter tokamak test is, facility, is now under construction. There is the ABC laser facility, which is the the main uh, Italian laser facility, Protosfera, which is a spherical, spherical tokamak, and the Frascati neutron generator, which is a powerful neutron uh, facility. But of course, there are other activities. Uh, we are talking about development of laser sources for several applications, terra studies, apparatus and applications, eximer laser, X, UV, and extreme UV sources, synthesis and study of new materials, neutral beam source, particle accelerators, uh, laser for cultural heritage, and analytical techniques for ecosystem studies. So here you see, in, even in Frascati, you don't find just nuclear fusion activities. But within the nuclear department, uh, we have in fact not only fusion, but also fission, security, health, and environment. And that is also the Italian Institute for Ionizing Radiation Measurement. And you can see the stakeholders are uh, international, of course, and are the main that you can imagine. I, when I came first, um, uh, first years here in Frascati, I found an environment which was uh, very much interested for me and challenging. And uh, I tried to recall which was the history of this beautiful place, scientifically speaking, for me. And in fact, the laser activities in Enea started since the very early times of the laser itself. Even before, because in the 60s, before the 60s, a group of researchers uh, headed by Ascoli Bartoli was actually working on uh, imaging of plasmas at the time before of the laser with just uh, uncoherent light. At the time, the Enea was called CNEN, Comitato Nazionale per Energia Nucleare. We all know that uh, on the 60s, May 1960, uh, Teodoro Maiman uh, operated the first laser at the Hugh Research Laboratories in California. It was a ruby laser at that time, so with 694 nanometer wavelength. Just a few months later, the first Italian laser system was prepared here in Frascati and operated in 1961 in the laboratory of Gassionizzati of Vasco Libartori Group. Then to, to, thanks to the help of Franco Rosetti, for those of you who know, is one, uh, was one of the Fermi's ragazzi of the Apanisperna. With this new source, the group was capable to obtain just the following year, the first shadowgraph and Schlieren measurements of plasmas by laser. 
So not only they build the first laser in Italy, but they also use them for an application which is now standard. And it, there, there was the publication at that time in 1962. This to mention that expertise of the people in actually working on laser and laser technologies was since the very beginning. Uh, the first European conference on laser interaction with matter was held here uh, in 1966 uh, in collaboration with the Nobel Prize Nikolai Basso and continue up to today. The next edition is in Portugal uh, this year. Many activities were performed since the pioneering era involving theoretical and numerical studies, experiments, laser and diagnostic development. This has produced many significant advancements on laser development, laser matter interactions, and inertial confined fusion, uh, which are now fundamental for the activities uh, nowadays. Several lasers were built over the years. The ABC laser with an anodymium phosphate glass medium was defined, and the full operation was achieved at the end of the 80s, let's say nine, uh, first beginning of the 90s. Similarly, the NEA free electron laser group operates in Prascati since the very beginning of the FEL era and continues to investigate the FEL emission mechanisms in different operating regimes, both theoretically and experimentally. In NEA Centro di Cerca Frascati, a research program about uh, free electron laser started in the mid 80s for the realization of a compact FEL operating a long wave, wavelength part of the electromagnetic spectrum related of course, we are talking about FEL, okay? So we are talking about terahertz emission in this case. Now I go directly to the description of uh, the facility. So, uh, this is the ABC laser, which you, as you can see the scheme uh, plot uh, in here, it's a two beams laser. The medium is uh, neodymium phosphate glass. It's the same medium of uh, much higher energy facilities like uh, laser mega joule or, uh, or, or NIF. Uh, working at the same fundamental wavelength of uh, 1050 1, nanometers, four nanometers. We have two beams, 100 joule per beam. The duration can be changed between 2.5 and 7 nanoseconds. At the end, uh, we get uh, two petawatt per centimeter square intensity, so 10 to the 15 watt per square centimeter, uh, with linear or circular polarization. And uh, we have the capability to get uh, this beam in a very high quality of uh, flatness in, uh, in the uh, intensity profile and focus by means of induced space co incoherence. But in this case, of course, the intensity is, is lower. This intensity on target can be decreased of several other magnitudes to, to meet the requirements for the radiation that is needed. Together with the main fundamental wavelength, we can run at second harmonic, or we can use one beam at second harmonic and one fundamental. This means better in interaction in some conditions, or so better coupling of the laser to, to the plasma. But in some cases, this is to be avoided. And what is also very much important is the set of diagnostic beams. Coming back to shadowgraphy and Schlieren, well, these are, of course, here, uh, since uh, it was invented here as diagnostic, uh, they are uh, routine diagnostics that we have in four different channels, time shifted one with respect to the other. This is a scheme of the laser. This is the main oscillator, which is a classical switch. And then here we have a pulse shaper for the main 50 nanoseconds beam. We come back to three nanoseconds or 2.5 or 7, depending on the on the pulse shaper uh, parameters that we choose. And then we have a set of different amplifiers that you can see follows the, the, the smallest, ma smaller one. We go to larger one in order to increase the beam diameter and then uh, to have uh, lower problems in terms of self-focusing, uh, not only in air, but also in the glass. Here we have the splitting of the beams into twin identical um, pulses which follow this path that you can see here. And then they go to the interaction chamber from two different directions. But part of the main beam is taken here, doubled in frequency, and then goes to these uh, for beam splitters, and then to, for these channels for, you see, interferometry or shadowgraphy. Here, the scheme is for infrared, but if we put where the mouse is now, a KDP converter, double harmonic, uh, second harmonic converter, we can have green irradiation instead of uh, infrared one. 
the the percentage of uh, uh, transmission now it's uh, around 40 percent so we end up about 40 joules more or less uh, for the for the green uh, line this is the experimental chamber which has a specific peculiarity with respect also to many other facilities in europe and also abroad um, out of it the chamber is equipped with extremely wide learn and number of diagnostics for practically everything, and I will show you in the next uh, uh, slide. Here you see a scheme of the four uh, um, pulses for sh shadowgraphy and interferometry, but there are X-ray cameras and, uh, well, a, really a, lot, a, a large number of diagnostics that are somehow resumed here. I think it's worth to, dis I mean, to describe quite uh, uh, quickly which of them uh, we have. So interferometry shadowgraphy, practically to, for channels, we can just increase the number of one of the other according to the need. Measurement of reflected and transmitted light, and now by means of the fast uh, calibrated photodiodes, but we have already, uh, already keeping uh, the chamber with a set of uh, several optical fibers to have uh, some, somehow four pi uh, measurement of uh, reflection and transmission. Visible street cameras, we have two of them, high resolution and high sensitivity. Optical spectrometers also uh, got quite a good number. One X-ray street camera, uh, has two arrays of X-ray diode detectors, a time-gated micro strip, uh, strip microchannel plate. Actually, we have two of them, which is, this is a, a, actually, a, actually a rare diagnostics to find. A micro channel plate for X-ray diagnostic imaging with different pinholes and different filtering for uh, spatially integrated, uh, but uh, spectrally uh, resolved images. Uh, X-ray transmission gratings for uh, uh, spectroscopy. Time of flight Faraday caps, two arrays. Time of flight diamond detectors, or time of flight, uh, um, in this case, semiconductor um, uh, sensors. We have several of them in collaboration with the University of Tor Vergata. Time of flight scintillator, uh, also one of the big area. Two Thomson spectrometers for low energy ions, the one, those producing ABC laser facility. Probes for uh, EMP measurements, we will discuss about EMP later. Conductive probes and electro-optical probes by means of uh, pockets effect. Plastic detectors for particles, imaging plate diagnostics and scanner. Confocal microscope for surface characterization of targets. And we are also developing other diagnostics like uh, two visors. Uh, large area diamond detector, uh, large area time of flight scintillator, electron spectrometers, and so on. So the number, this number of diagnostics, this is the important part, is uh, used for each shot. Uh, each of them is set automatically or so, or just a few of them are to be ma uh, mounted manually. Each of them are uh, with all, of, all the diagnostics and data, they are automatically retrieved. Um, stored and managed and users can come here with the computer and have a, use a software with that was produced by, by us for analyzing the data just after the shot. Okay, now I go, not only this is just the laser, but I want to go to the secondary sources related to the laser. And for this, I just give a brief introduction of laser matter interaction. Uh, just to mention that, the, of course, the interaction of a pulsed high-intensity laser on a suitable target produces plasma, but also hot electrons, uh, ions, and electromagnetic emission, both ionizing and not ionizing. If laser intensity is high enough, talking about 10 to the 14 watt per square centimeter, we have physical processes with capability to effectively accelerate electrons, like the resonance absorption and parametric instabilities. Generally speaking, uh, laser matter interaction, IDB, ABC, laser intensities produce two electron populations. The thermal one up to, let's say, one keV of temperature at maximum, and the hot temperature for electrons that can be modeled with, uh, let's say, up to several tens of MAV, of MAV in laser with picosecond and femtosecond intensity, but for ABC, we go up to several hundreds of keV at most. The transient plasma uh, uh, produced is emitted especially along the target normal direction in quasi spherical symmetry with densities uh, come starting from the solid density up to going up to the uh, to the um, third um, uh, root third, third power of third uh, if we go uh, 
apart from the target, decreases with the volume, practically speaking, and is made of the target material. So you can choose the specific target that you want and then the plasma material. The hot electron component comes with a ionic component, which is excited practically that the potential left for the electrons. So with quite similar energy and wide spectra and also a large number of particles. But such processes generate an intense electromagnetic radiation of nanosecond emission. Uh, we are talking about not ionizing. So of course the, the, the light coming from uh, the reflected light, but also secondary nonlinear processes, but also radio frequency and microwaves, infrared and visible. This is the not, not ionizing as mentioned, but there is also UV and SOX, soft, soft X, hard X and gammas in the, in the high end. This is the basic scheme. It means that we can use two lasers for the same target and then to have two uh, similar interactions. We can put target, secondary targets here and here to have this emission uh, uh, interacting with all of them, but also they can, we can use two different targets. And so to have a plasma of one target produced by this laser and the secondary plasma produced by the, the other laser with different composition, interaction parameters, and so on. Coming back to the actual secondary sources coming before because of the laser matter interaction, we, we, we can provide transient plasmas of elements which can be chosen with a large variety by changing the target, as mentioned, with temperature from a few electron volt up to 100 of electron volt, 1 kV, just to mention, and densities uh, uh, up to 10 to the 21 uh, centimeters cube, down to several orders of magnitudes if we move uh, uh, farther from the target according to the distance. Heavy element plasmas have already been used, like for example, uh, uh, tungsten. Accelerated electrons, we can have, as mentioned, the thermal component and the hot component. Accelerated ions, uh, protons, for example, up to 100 of keV, and heavier ions as carbon or even tungsten uh, with even larger energies. The high intensity transient electromagnetic radiation, with as mentioned, the radio frequency and microwaves, infrared and visible, UV and soft X, hard X, and gammas, with the emission, the last, the, the last three from three to 10 nanoseconds, which is the plasma duration, more or less. But EMPs, the transient radio frequency and microwaves, can last up to hundreds of nanoseconds. The important point is that for each of these components, the electromagnetic uh, radiation, and in general also for the particles, at the moment where they emit, we are talking about a power higher than 100 megawatts. If we consider the main ABC laser, we are talking about, with the two beams, around 60 gigawatts of power for each shot. I just mentioned in little more details the offer in terms of radio frequency microwaves, because as many of you know, the interaction of intense uh, laser with matter produce uh, what they are called electromagnetic pulses, which are in the radio frequency microwaves, which are spread in the full experimental chamber for intensities which are beyond the megawatt per meter order. It's now a very hot topic. Uh, the, you see the publication, this is a practically white paper made by all the laboratories working in this field, was recognized of very high interest in the, this uh, journal with the, the, let's say, with the award. And there is also a laser, laser lab expert group on laser generated electromagnetic pulses. People is interested in understanding the actual reasons, sources of these fields. For some, in some cases, most of the cases to minimize them because there can be serious problems for diagnostics, electronics, but also for using them. There are a lot of applications. And in ENEA, we actually exploited this with a patent. And uh, we, we can also offer a source of electromagnetic pulses uh, with the unique features to, to users. Applications. Well, applications regards uh, radiation hardness of materials and material science studies. Uh, we're talking about exposition to ionizing and not ionizing fields, exposition to plasmas, exposition to particles, uh, electrons and ions. Ultraviolet irradiation uh, for specific contrast microscopy at high UV intensity. These are already been done. All, all the things that I mentioning are already been performed in the facility. For example, for uh, micro, uh, contact microscopy, microscopy of living cells, but of course not only. Test on materials for aerospace applications or for electronics and telecommunications, for uh, laser shock pinning, you know, the technique because I 
with a shock, I change the parameters of the material in order to increase the, the hardness. Another important point is that the extreme wide diagnostic portfolio of the ABC facility allows for precise characterization of the inter irradiation and also of the post irradiated samples because of the uh, all the devices that we have. For each shot, uh, such large amount of data can be used as, as a reference for further experiments to then to perform to be performed then in other facilities uh, with higher repetition rate, like for example ILAs, but where the diagnostic portfolio is not so rich. So a few shots in ABC with all the diagnostics can disclose the physics and the potential applications that can be repeated in much higher repetition rate, but to, in places where not all the diagnostics are present. Uh, access commonly performed in uh, this facility in collaborative basis to institutions and small medium enterprises, but access has, has been also granted successfully in the remade project to a small medium enterprise in the last year, just to mention an example. Okay, so now I talk about the uh, uh, other part of the talk, which is related to FEL, for electron lasers. Uh, you see here a picture where free electron lasers are uh, grouped, uh, sorry, not free electron lasers, but terahertz sources, including also free electron lasers, uh, talking about frequency in terahertz and uh, average power in watt. Of course, we are talking about not just single shot, but uh, uh, periodic or CB CW. You see here the sources, uh, solid state oscillators, uh, gas lasers, quantum cascade lasers, laser driven emitters, and free electron laser sources. And those with uh, this sign are those present in an EA that are uh, available for uh, irradiations. This is uh, just a scheme of the EA Frascatifel facility, which is, uh, you see, in, in a bunker, but then, then with this, this wave guard, also the terrors is uh, taken out and used for applications. Uh, the terahertz compact, it's called compact FEL Atenea Frascati, uses a 40, uh, 14 picoseconds electron beam with 4 ampere peak electron bunch with 2.3 MeV energy coming from microton, which are injected into a 20 centimeters long, 2.5 centimeters period permanent magnet indurator. Uh, surrounded by a hybrid waveguard resonator to generate coherent uh, terahertz radiation. Important things are that there is a wide uh, bandwidth operation to an ability roughly uh, starting from 90 to 150 gigahertz by variety, writing the resonator length. The power is 10 kilowatt in the 60 picoseconds of single pulse, but if we consider the, the range is 1.5 kilowatt in the four microseconds uh, main bunch of uh, Pulses as I discussed later. The single frequency operation, if we use a filter and we take just a single frequency, is around 300 watt in the four microseconds bunch. This is the scheme that I was talking about before. So we have this uh, uh, consider a bunch of several uh, pulses lasting four microseconds. Each pulse is around 50, 60 picoseconds. And uh, uh, so we have the separation at three gigahertz frequency of 330 picoseconds period between, so the, the actual distance between one pass and the following one. Here you can see the average power in the, in the considering all of them five milliwatt, but the micropulse power around uh, 500 watt with the micropulse power, the peak is around three kilowatt. Considering this terahertz radiation focused in an area of 0.5 centimeter square, the peak radiation is uh, around two kilovolt per centimeter of terahertz radiation in, the, in, in that area, which is very good for several applications, for example, for biological studies, but not only. Coming to other sources, we have gas laser with optical pumping, CO2 laser which can operate in CW, modulated up to one kilohertz, and is Q-switched. The important thing of this laser is that has a wide spectral emission range for, uh, uh, from 40 microns up to 1.2 millimeters, as you see with different uh, uh, terahertz associated to the wavelength, uh, around one milliwatt uh, output power. The most intense line is around 2.5 terahertz, but the good thing also is that bandwidth depends on the active gas media chosen that can be changed quite easily. And so this is a very uh, 
a wide uh, opportunity of uh, wavelength and so of terahertz emission that we can produce by this. Here we have uh, the uh, Thais Afar laser pumped by uh, doubled neodymium HIAG laser, generating 120 femtosecond pulses at 800 nanometers with average power of around 1.5 watt. And it can generate wide bandwidth transition radiation between 0.5 and 2 terahertz by means of photoconductive switches. This is a scheme where this laser is used. You see here a beam splitter and here an optical delay, which can be changed. Here there is the emitter, which is a photoconductive antenna indeed. And then there is the sample to be irradiated. This is one of the possible schemes of implementation. The actual use of this scheme is, uh, of this setup is for rather defectometry of materials, uh, measurements of the plasma index of refraction in stationary plasmas, in this case, and Faraday rotation measurements to determine the local magnetic fields. Solid state, to, say, state sources uh, to be added to those that I already mentioned is a compact impact diode with 97 gigahertz and uh, 70 milliwatt in CW. Gig oscillator, which uh, is tunable between 18 and 40 gigahertz with output power uh, still very nice, 20 milliwatt in CW. Uh, both sources can be used inside the portable terahertz imaging system developed at Enaflascati with shot key diodes used as detectors. This is a scheme of 2020, 2020, sorry and 330 gigahertz, one milliwatt CW solid state source. Here we have the computer tunable source, this is the coupler and then the frequency multiplier. And then here we have uh, the, the, the waveguard going uh, to applications or here to the detector. Just a few words about terahertz. Uh, here you see the spectrum. Terahertz uh, radiation penetrates most plastic materials, cellulose and clothes. This is important for applications, of course, related to recyclable materials. Terahertz radiation shows less reliable scattering than near infrared, of course, because of the difference wavelength. Uh, we know that. Despite the limitations to the water, up, water absorption, penetration is sufficient for surface subsurface investigations. It, it is possible to improve spatial resolution by linear film microscopy. The use of short terahertz passes or phase sensitive techniques, techniques can provide information in depth. Terahertz imaging areas range from biomedicine to security, from material inspection to environmental studies and art conservations. And I mean, it's a field in development. Here I show just a few applications already, let's say with experience in here. Here you see some uh, human cells, uh, which have been put in, uh, you, see, you see this setup, this is the compact FPL passed um, irradiation here. It's also used in some configuration with the EEG oscillator in continuous wave. And here you can see that uh, there is the, the radiation of the sample, but also uh, without thermal increase uh, of, um, uh, so temperature increase of the, in the samples because the average power is very low, is the peak power, which is high. This is a, a, a setup used for uh, measurements of uh, reflection coming from specific samples. Here, the, the important thing is that the reflection is uh, uh, automatically scaled to uh, incoming laser because there is a double directional coupler. So you, uh, in each moment, you don't know just the, the, the reflection, but also the reflection in uh, relation to the incoming. So it's uh, practically calibrated the reflection. Here you see an investigation of hidden delays in an uh, electronic circuit. You see here it has been performed in, uh, by, in, in Tokyo with this uh, uh, terahertz uh, bandwidth, but here we use just one order of magnitude less, uh, lower frequency, but then we are capable to see much better details of the same, um, of the same radiation because we decrease diffraction problems. Here you see uh, another use, in this case for a terrace art project, you have some uh, material put um, to cover the actual uh, manufacture. Here you see classical terrace imaging made in Japan does not show so much details, but here you have even a better contrast here. Uh, and you can get that because of the low uh, terrace uh, uh, frequency used. 
This is for example, but also an important setup for making a uh, wide um, area uh, irradiation studies uh, was, was uh, performed and benchmarked and used here for masterpieces, uh, uh, work of art uh, measurements. You see here is a, here a painting, but uh, I mean, this is the large area that has been scanned and uh, some uh, um, experiments have been performed in masterpieces at the Fisi Museums and Palazzo Chigi. I like now to mention a few applications and few sources also going beyond just the ABC laser and uh, FEL, uh, because we have here Infrascati in our division. And so I like to mention the ultraviolet radiation test laboratory, where you can see here uh, you have practically several samples. So you use a mercury lamp. This is a facility already very much used and also with uh, uh, facility time already uh, for uh, companies, Monument Enterprises, already with several uh, contracts, facility for testing the behavior of materials under wideband ultraviolet radiation under controlled parameters. Intensity can reach a solar out of atmosphere acceleration factor of 12 with temperature lower than 40 uh, Celsius degree, so thanks to the helium environment. Mercury lamp can work continuously for many days, and all the parameters are constantly monitored by dedicated electronics. It's planned to change the lamp with LEDs in order to have better replication of the solar ultraviolet spectrum. This is used, for example, for, um, um, uh, let's say, uh, um, um, irradiation related to materials which are exposed to solar radiation. Another facility is the discharge produced plasma, produce uh, extreme UV. We are talking about 62 up to 100, uh, 124 electron volt with uh, 35 millijoule per star radiant. Uh, duration 100 nanoseconds, uh, full width at maximum. Uh, this is for testing and calibration of innovative radiation detectors relevant for space applications and also for pattern generation uh, by extreme UV radiation of photonic materials like lithium prolite, or uh, for chemical amplified res resist, for example. We have also a set of uh, uh, X-ray lamps portfolio within the NIXT laboratory. You can see 800, uh, 80 kilovolt, 1 milliampere, 80 kilovolt, 50 kilovolt, 1 milliampere, and 50 kilovolt, 1 milliampere. Uh, you, uh, a new source to be available shortly will be 120 kilowatt, will be 0 0.3 million per. Uses for fluorescence uh, X-ray studies, sensor calibration, microtomography of biological systems, for example, but not only, of course, and po polycapillary lenses. I complete the, the, the view with uh, one interesting uh, facility, which is not something that you find quite easily is a fun facility, so the facility for acceleration and neutralization, which is within, which is within our uh, division in the DTT laboratory specifically. The source is tantalum wire, so we have a source of ions, uh, uh, an acceleration, a gas, uh, which is, can be hydrogen, deuterium, helium, an electromagnetic field, uh, electromagnet, sorry, field of 2.5 kilogauss. We can use hydrogen, uh, um, uh, uh, produce ions. Then we have uh, a, a, an accretor up to 100 kilovolt and then with the maximum accelerator energy of 110 keV. That can be used as ions or they can be neutralized by using uh, hydrogen. So it's possible to produce beams of accelerated neutral particles uh, up to 110 keV. It's not something that you find so easily with this energy range and with this type of particles, uh, so usually in, uh, in, in Europe and not only. The use is for the electrical calibration on ions and neutral atoms, study of the effects on materials due to the radiation with neutral atom beams, for example. I go to the summary. Several sources and diagnostics are available at the NEA Centro Frascati, Centro Ricerca Frascati, which have been reviewed, but not all, all of them. Several applications of them have been mentioned as, as examples to show the potentialities of these facilities present in the center. Many applied activities have been conducted over the years 
with these sources of material science, radiation alternatives of materials and components, electron dynamics studies in solid state devices, biological studies, carter heritage and diagnostics. I, I just mentioned them in order to show that it is not that we have just the facility and the sources. We already used and we have uh, already had the users uh, that has uh, got our beam time in, the, in this broad range. An important point is that the significant technology development is needed in order to extend the use of recyclable materials to industry products, systems, and applications where they are still not very well spread, which is the main core of the remade project. But in order to do that, it's important that, uh, uh, let's say, these materials can find applications also in environments where, where uh, they must withstand extreme conditions, for example, in aerospace uh, applications, but not only, and their properties but must be then evaluated well in advance under ionizing and not ionizing radiation. These are still open questions. The, these materials are still to be better engineer, engineered, but also there is a study about that. And with this unique portfolio that I showed, which of course is much richer than, uh, even much richer than I showed not today, and it's broad experience on a very wide set of different applications, we can certainly be a reference location for tests needed for this important step forward.